Our next speaker has a master's degree in civil engineering from Asian Institute of Technology in Bangkok, Thailand. He has a PhD in civil engineering majoring in water from the University of the New South Wales in Australia. And he is the, the managing director of Hydronet Consultants Incorporated. So uh, he specializes in drainage and flood control and wastewater treatment and has led various projects of multidisciplinary teams of specialization. Everyone, please help me welcome and let's give a warm virtual applause to Dr. Danilo T. Hake. Hello, good afternoon. I hope you're still there. Okay, uh, just allow me to share the slides. Okay. Um, okay, so uh, good afternoon, everyone. Mang hapon sa mga Cebuano. And good afternoon to those who are viewing this webinar from outside the country. This afternoon, I was tasked to uh, deliver something on drainage master plan of subdivision development. Uh, so, so this afternoon, I will just be sharing uh, a lot of our experience over the last 15, 20 years uh, of doing drainage planning here in Cebu and also in many other parts of the country, in Mindanao and also in Metro Manila. The uh, topic is very much focused on, uh, on subdivision, uh, but I would like to uh, expand this a little bit to look at some uh, problem and issues also in uh, um, in you know expanding that to a bigger uh, catchment. Okay, so uh, let me just go through the uh, outline. A minute. Okay, so I'll simply tackle a little bit on the uh, different uh, drainage and flooding issues, um, not only here in Cebu, but uh, in many other parts of uh, the country. Um, Engineer Rick Fornis has already mentioned a number of those, and uh, with those slides and uh, photos shown of, uh, of previous flooding. Um, also in planning a drainage, we cannot do away with uh, some governing laws and codes that uh, are necessary in order for us to come up with a uh, more realistic and also uh, compliant with, uh, with uh, the city ordinances and also the national laws if we have those. Then I'll take you through um, the planning process of um, doing some uh, drainage master plan. And then uh, I would like to talk about also on the sustainable drainage um, systems. I believe this one is very important uh, nowadays. As you notice that uh, uh, even with uh, the many drainage master plan that has been conducted in the city, um, somehow we have not really, uh, um, we have improved in some section, but uh, in terms of the number of incidents, we are still uh, really lagging behind in terms of solving our problem. So just a, a chart that uh, will perhaps guide you through in our presentation. We look at the drainage issue, uh, the planning process. Um, we have, uh, of course, look at the defined, uh, defined the target return period, the uh, standards you have designed calculation and modeling. Uh, we also very important in the planning also is balancing the cost and also the environmental benefits of um, different structures. And then lastly, I'll deal with uh, the sustainable drainage. 
Okay. Um, so, the flooding issues in Metro Cebu. As you notice, the frequency of flooding and the number of flood prone areas over the last two decades has really increased. Uh, there was one report, we did a master planning in uh, somewhere around 2006 for Cebu City. I was part of that as a technical team leader. Um, reported something like about um, 100 flood prone areas. Um, but, uh, you know, the, the report also um, during our study with JICA in 2014, we're looking at uh, more than 300 um, flood prone areas. In Mandawi alone, which we uh, completed uh, last year, um, around, 200, around 200 flood prone areas um, have been reported. And these are reported also by, uh, confirmed by the barangay officials as we did some uh, field activity during the study. So it has increased uh, significantly over the last two decades. And uh, uh, you can see the reason behind that, of course, the development as uh, it was presented already. Um, urban development has increased tremendously. Second, uh, I'd like to highlight on um, the issue that uh, many of our engineers are still utilizing uh, to the present time um, is the conventional solution that are not adequate to address the changing climate and uh, growing metropolis. Uh, the conventional solution <coughs> considers stormwater as a nuisance and therefore uh, it has to be uh, collected immediately and discharged to the water wastes. That is the common mindset. Uh, but uh, as you know, um, other countries have been adopting already a, a sponge um, concept. Um, you know, SADS, for example, sustainable drainage, where you have to balance the hydrology, hydrologic uh, systems, um, mimic the natural environment uh, in order to uh, maintain the, um, the original um, natural processes. Of course, with the development, as was already mentioned, more and more areas are paved, resulting into higher peak flows and also volume of water that goes to waterways. So, so these things, uh, this is still an issue because nowhere uh, you can find in our local ordinance that we need to shift from the um, conventional uh, the traditional view of handling our stormwater and adopting a system that uh, will be more or less sustainable in the future. And uh, related to that is, of course, the lack of policy to address stormwater management. Um, um, take note that I have been using the word stormwater. Um, I'm going to show you later on uh, that uh, this particular part of the system, hydrologic cycle, is not uh, clearly um, addressed in, in terms of how we're going to manage them. Okay, uh, this is, uh, of course, a uh, common scenario, common site that uh, you can see every now and then, particularly during rainy season. <clears throat> this is Starting from 2011, uh, the left uh, top left portion of this photo. Um, 2011, you have 2012, 2013, 14. Uh, this is 15 up to 2019. So, and this is not only happening once every year. It happens uh, a number of times from the month of June until December. So clearly, uh, if you look at the uh, frequency and severity of flood, it is not one in one year, it's not one in two years, but many times uh, during the year, 
we expect uh, something like uh, five to ten incidents of flooding in the downtown area. So that's the that's the problem that we are facing. And so therefore, it is really necessary not only to look at the uh, drainage master plan of a subdivision, but uh, to look at the whole catchment uh, where the subdivision is part of. So what are the issues? There are varied issues. It's not only technical. But let's begin with the technical issues. In many of our planning studies, many of our um, design, uh, drainage design subdivision. A lot of these areas um, nowadays are located in flood prone areas. So, number one, it's flood prone, uh, close to the coastline, uh, and perhaps it's the terrain is flat. If you look at uh, Mactan, for example, Mactan Island, the whole Mactan Island is generally flat and there is no outfall. So, the question is where do we discharge? Where do we bring in the water after uh, we collect them within the subdivision? So um, that uh, posed some question uh, really on simply managing the uh, total volume of storm water within the development. Um, except for those areas that are connected to the, road, um, the main roads, um, then there are drainage systems that you can connect to. Uh, but at the same time, for example, in um, MEPS 2, where we had some project before, the DPWH has uh, um, somehow uh, restricted the connection of the drainage line or drainage outfall to their drainage line. Um, and there were, they have some reason for that, uh, why they do not want to be connected. And so that posed uh, a number of problems. If DPWH will not uh, accept uh, stormwater from any outfall, then where do we discharge? Another problem is uh, a property that is being crossed by a creek. Uh, and that becomes problematic, uh, especially if the developer will start backfilling and, uh, and do not have any receiving pipe uh, or any runoff or flow coming from the upstream portion. And so that becomes a problem for the property that is uh, located upstream. And I heard in the news one time, I think that was a couple of years ago, where the um, uh, fence collapsed because of the buildup of, uh, of uh, flood waters upstream. Another problem is a property beside major river. That is problematic in the sense that uh, um, you really have to look at the bigger picture. Um, I have one client in uh, Davao where a uh, uh, medium to high end subdivision is located, located uh, beside Davao River, which is a major uh, river with about 1,700 uh, square kilometers catchment area. And uh, the problem there is you cannot just simply, you need to determine the flood depth or flood water of that particular river when it overflows. And one at one time, I think uh, somewhere around 50 to 60 years return period, uh, the water uh, somehow reached um, the outfall of the um, property and uh, submerge uh, part of the road network. And so that uh, will have to be clearly identified and analyzed in terms of uh, uh, the bigger flood that is coming in the future, uh, particularly from Mijo River. Another thing, for example, uh, shallow groundwater is also another problem in the sense that uh, if you are dependent on um, lagoon as your discharge, then uh, uh, the absorption rate will also be uh, a difficult thing or limited. And um, another issue also would be the uh, risk to water, groundwater contamination. Of course, uh, uh, in all of this, 
we, we look at some technical expertise that we need in order to analyze the whole thing. But there is another one that I'd like to uh, mention as we go along with our discussion this afternoon is the legal and institutional aspect. Um, this is an issue in the sense that uh, we have a number of laws uh, governing our waterways that has not been um, enforced. For example, um, Republic Act uh, 1067, which is the water code, and a uh, number of stipulations there regarding uh, drainage ways, regarding also easement. Um, but uh, clearly, as you can see, in uh, an urban area, um, those easement uh, simply disappears, and uh, and that's the reason. That's the reason why that uh, there will be some a lot of difficulty from the technical side also implementing a proper uh, drainage uh, um, right of way. Uh, another thing is the policy, no policy for stormwater management. Uh, um, that's an issue. Other countries have adopted stormwater management um, as a guiding principle to uh, address drainage uh, system, to design drainage system that has been incorporated in their was in the Philippines. Um, I even look at one report on uh, integrated water resource management where several countries reported what they have done in terms of stormwater policy and implementation. Uh, but when I look at uh, the Philippines, um, it was simply a blank. There was no report at the time. This was, I think, uh, 2015. So, uh, so we're lacking in that area. Waterways are blocked, were diverted, uh, and uh, in, in terms of institutional, there's a lack of personnel to really uh, design perhaps and monitor what has been implemented uh, in this particular aspect. And the last one, of course, this is always the complaint of uh, uh, DPWH, uh, particularly on uh, and the last one I mentioned, the water uh, right of way issues. Uh, but basically, a lot of uninformed stakeholders. Um, I read in, in uh, social media about different ideas on how to solve the problem. Um, and, um, a number of those have, different, have uh, good ideas, uh, but perhaps um, are needing some guidance also on how to tackle that. Um, lack of knowledge in terms of uh, uh, the use of concern. I remember one time um, a, a developer um, mentioned to me or, or, or asked me, does it really matter if I'm going to pave my whole um, land area? <laughs> and I told him, of course it matters. Uh, we alter the uh, local hydrologic uh, cycle. So these are the issues that we're dealing with. <clears throat> so let me just uh, simply browse through um, some relevant laws and codes that we can refer to, as I have said, when we uh, do some planning, we need to also uh, check on the re relevant laws that uh, we should base on and some codes. So the first one, of course, uh, dates back in 1975 is the sanitation code. And it's simply, uh, when I browse through the whole um, document, it simply mentioned about the responsibility of the city, municipality to have, um, you know, to maintain a sanitary state, uh, satisfactory system of drainage um, in all areas. Um, but uh, again, uh, as you look at this one, there is no uh, mention of the guiding principle. I think, uh, of course, uh, we need to have um, an IRR, you know, for all of these uh, stipulations. The one that is very um, familiar, perhaps, to all of us here in the Philippines is the Water Code in 1977. It's um, simply um, if you look at policy statement, all waters belong to the state. 
somehow it belongs to the state, but if it is uh, occupied by private uh, individual, the state will have some difficulty on uh, uh, expropriating that. That's really the problem. Talks about the utilization, exploitation, development, conservation, protection of water resources shall be subject to the control and regulation of the government. Now, if you look at water resources, um, you probably think about uh, those water that you can see in uh, major rivers, uh, lakes, of course, coastal waters. Um, but I don't think that the, uh, um, the lawmakers at that time um, have that storm water as foremost in their thought. As you can see, this is now given to the National Water Resources Board, <coughs> WRB, uh, to provide the uh, issue permits and also uh, provide monitoring um, for all the uh, water resources we have in the Philippines. So stormwater basically is, is absent in these laws. Um, but this one, uh, under Article 51 of our water code, um, is basis uh, of uh, the easement water waterways, three meters in urban areas. Of course, the three meters, I, would, I should say that it is based from the highest level of um, the particular waterway. So it is, not, it is not simply the banks that you can see or the water that you you can see during dry season. Um, so if in the natural sense, water level extends during rainy season up to 20 meters uh, from the main bed. So you have to measure from there, three meters in urban area, 20 meters in agricultural, 40 meters in forested area. And these are subject to public use uh, for uh, individual use. Drainage right of way. Um, so this is Article 50 in the same code. And the lower estates are obliged to receive the waters. It's naturally and without the intervention of man flow from the higher estates, as well as the stone or earth. This is talking about the sediments. So the lower estate is obliged to receive. So you cannot really block a uh, waterway simply because you are building subdivision or commercial or whatever, whatever development you're doing. Um, if it is a waterway that is defined by um, the topography, um, then uh, whether it has water during rainy, uh, during uh, no water during dry season, that is still considered to be a uh, waterway. So, but there is, uh, there is a, uh, a provision also in the same article, the owner of the lower estate cannot construct works which will impede this natural flow unless he provides an alternative method of drainage. And uh, then it follows, neither can the owner of the higher estate make works which will increase this natural flow. So if you look at this one, that gives us an idea that we need to somehow maintain <clears throat> um, or less the runoff volume, discharge, peak flow coming from upstream. If you are a developer from upstream, this particular code gives us an idea that we need to put up something. We need to uh, construct something uh, that will minimize um, the increase of uh, flow going downstream. Because any development uh, basically is going to alter uh, the hydrologic cycle, particularly the flow hydrograph. Another thing which was uh, brought to my attention <clears throat> as I was writing a paper for uh, National Academy for Science and Technology is uh, the water catchment law, which was uh, um, enacted in 1989. Uh, so I look at this one. Republic Act 6716. This is an act providing for the construction of water wells. And then I highlighted there the rainwater collectors, development of springs, rehabilitation. And this is a policy of uh, 
national policy uh, that will promote quality of life for Filipino. And this is now embedded uh, under the Department of Public Works and Highways and uh, to construct, to implement such. But uh, um, if, you, if you look at this one, I'm not sure, I'm not sure uh, if uh, this is really the priority of the DPWH nowadays. Uh, <clears throat> they're looking at, of course, uh, major river uh, system, uh, major, major and principal rivers in the Philippines, uh, providing for the necessary plan for flood mitigation. But for this one, uh, 1989, um, of course, this is part of the law to construct uh, rainwater collectors. Uh, of course, under the devolution of law, um, the local government is mandated to also uh, provide such. I picked up some um, a relevant policy on subdivision, as uh, we will be talking about subdivision, because this is very important. Um, as I have mentioned uh, a while ago, that any development uh, results in the alteration of uh, catchment properties, and as a result, uh, increase in peak flow. So uh, we better look at what are the uh, provisions in uh, subdivision. Um, open spaces, for example, here, this is RA 953, um, you know, planting of trees is required. But this was um, um, a promulgation in 1976 talking about 30% of the total area, exclusive of roads, street uh, service streets, alleys, as open space for parks, rec recreational area. No plan for subdivision shall be approved unless at least at least 30% uh, of the total area. So the subdivision uh, is reserved for this. So that's, that's a good start, you know, in terms of if we are planning a subdivision drainage, uh, uh, we're looking at minimizing uh, run of flow. Where are the open spaces? Uh, how much of this open space uh, that we can utilize in order to allow stormwater to uh, recharge back to our aquifer and, um, and perhaps an area where we can uh, provide temporary funding and, uh, or detention basin. Next is... Uh, the urban development and housing in 1977, again, um, talking about roads, alleys, uh, sidewalk, open spaces, again, about 30% of the gross area, but it also specifies um, uh, additional criteria simply for, for open space, you know, 9% uh, for um, 66 to 100 family lots, 9%, 7%, 3.5%. Um, this was also upgraded uh, already with the new BP 220, as you can see later on. Um, 1992, you look at that urban development and housing program, simply mention about uh, basic services, water supply, power, sewerage, waste management, and, uh, and transportation. Okay, so here is uh, there's some specific um, guidelines uh, on open space, which are very important in uh, managing, I would say managing our stormwater, not simply designing drainage. Um, you have 3.5% um, on um, density uh, dependent on, this is now dependent on the density. Above 225, then you increase the allocation of parks, playgrounds to 9%. So. Uh, when we plan uh, drainage and stormwater management, we look at this figure as a very important uh, um, area of allocation where we can utilize uh, divert um, percentage of our flow in order to um, satisfy ecological demands. By the way, <clears throat> As you know, um, Metro Cebu is very much dependent on uh, groundwater source, MCWD. I think the figure is somewhere around 80% uh, dependent on groundwater and only around 20% uh, 
surface water. So therefore, if uh, we neglect uh, this particular hydrologic process, infiltration, recharge to groundwater source, then uh, we will have a problem with our um, groundwater resources. In fact, uh, the water resources uh, University of San Carlos has conducted monitoring of, uh, of um, salinity intrusion in Metro Cebu back in 1990, 2000, 2010, I think. And um, there's, there's an indication of um, salinity intrusion into our um, uh, precious aquifer. So more that uh, we have to look at uh, recharge of uh, water into our groundwater resources. <clears throat> mm, so um, drainage system, this is BP220. Um, Mentions about drainage system must conform to the natural drainage, so on and so forth, uh, with minimum drainage pipe. And so that's how much you can uh, see in terms of uh, uh, the relevance of uh, drainage to uh, housing development. Um, this is PD957 uh, IRR. <clears throat> so also mentioned about drainage system in sub subdivision that you conform to the natural drainage pattern. Um, so there's some specific provision here that uh, you can read, um, but just for us to proceed quickly, I just made a summary of the relevant laws um, concerning drainage or water. And that starts with the sanitation code. Um, we have um, water code in uh, PD in 67. We have the water catchment law, but uh, this is pretty much uh, interpreted as um, catchment in the rural areas. Then you have, uh, there's a repetition here, the building code, of course, here. Uh, mention about drainage system that should not mix with uh, sewage. Um, the latter um, uh, Republic Acts 9275 and 9729 deals with the uh, uh, Clean Water Act and also the Climate Change Act. Um, here, again, uh, this laws um, will give us some hint that uh, we need to manage resources, uh, particularly on Water Resources Act, uh, pretty much focus on the quality aspect. Uh, but for 9729 climate change, simply um, it states some risk reduction, mitigation, adaptation for any climate related changes, um, such as sea level rise, intense rainfall resulting floods. So um, I believe that um, within the local government units and different areas, um, law must be done, must be stipulated policy issuance must be done to clearly um, address uh, the stormwater um, that is causing a lot of problem in our city. Okay, um, so that's, that gives us some idea on the loss that we have. Um, as I've mentioned towards the end, um, every city should review how we can uh, can have a holistic, uh, more coherent uh, policy in addressing stormwater, not just um, capturing not just the uh, river system, but really stormwater. <clears throat> Let's look at the planning process and uh, designing um, master plan, master planning drainage system. Some of this has been uh, mentioned by Ricky, so I don't have to deal with them very uh, in detail. But just to mention that uh, we look at uh, design parameters, particularly number one is rainfall intensity, deciding on the return period, risk, hazard. Um, if usually I would ask my client uh, in terms of uh, um, their comfort zone. Uh, private subdivision, as you, as you know, 
uh, are not really obliged by the city on what kind of return period um, you're going to choose. But uh, simply helping, I we would be helping the client decide on the best option. Uh, because if you pick the higher return period, uh, 10, 20, um, 10 years, that would be more expensive in terms of uh, the structural requirement compared to five years, two years. By the way, other countries I check, uh, uh, some of them are using even two years return period and uh, that serves them best. But if the particular development is sensitive uh, to any flood hazard, for example, one of those is a, in Balaban, uh, there's a industrial, industrial company that uh, requested us to do uh, drainage planning. So we also increase the return period instead of 10 years, so we pick up 25 or even 50 years in designing um, drainage system. So we look at the standards, codes, ordinances, uh, particularly in city. Um, uh, Cebu City has, but um, has an ordinance on um, related, I would say related to stormwater management, uh, particularly in the area of Cistern. However, I was surprised to see that uh, um, they are using uh, the standard in, I think, 1994. Uh, but there is another one in 2004, uh, which is that includes uh, area of uh, rooftop as a uh, basis for calculating the size of the cistern. So we look at those ordinances. Davao City has a, has a to me, a more, uh, has a good uh, ordinance uh, covering uh, stormwater management, covering um, rain, uh, rainwater catchment. You can you can Google that and check on the ordinance that they have. Look at the slope. You look at the minimum maximum velocity. Um, that can be checked after the initial layout. We also look at uh, whether we're going to use the combined or separate system. <clears throat> A number of high end development. Uh, are adapting a uh, separate system, uh, but the smaller ones preferred the uh, combined system, as they say, you know, uh, that's an additional cost in the uh, total uh, land development if you have a separate system. So others are still using combined system, but uh, this, of course, during uh, dry weather flow condition goes to a treatment process. Uh, but at the same time, uh, here, we do not have a uh, policy or law concerning uh, combined sewer overflows, CSOs. So uh, if you are uh, working with the government, uh, I would recommend that uh, you look at uh, these policies and perhaps some uh, dating of our existing policy to address combined sewer overflows, whether we need to, uh, to look into a separate system rather than combined system. We also don't have a reuse, recharge, release um, um, provisions in our policy. So that is also something. So if you can see, because there is not much uh, policy that is out there in terms of designing um, the uh, planning and design of uh, drainage in many subdivision development here in our city and many parts of the country are left to the uh, um, decision, discretion of the designer. So if you're a designer that doesn't have any, uh, um, you know, um, let's say that you don't care about the ecological implication of your, your design, uh, then um, you, the client will get what, what you have, what you offer. Of course, you look at cost consideration, um, environmental, ecological consideration and then that here we we look into the detention retention aspect basically another uh, bmps uh, bmp simply means best management practice uh, structures these are popularized uh, um, in 
the US and also LID. I think LID from US or Europe, <coughs> low impact development uh, systems. So we, we need to review all those uh, design parameters before we um, proceed with the uh, planning. And here you have uh, proceed with the data acquisition, the topographic map, attachment. Uh, these are basic information for designing uh, master plan. You have soil and geologic map. Uh, up into my slide. We also have to look at the land use and all these things. Um, the soil geologic map is important. Uh, we are lucky that in Mactan, uh, we have a, a geologic layer that has high capacity for infiltration. And so uh, many of the development there are still managing their uh, outflows uh, using uh, storage funds. But in Cebu, um, I have one project somewhere in Talisay, the infiltration rate, we did some study, is uh, quite low. So, um, so therefore, it cannot, we cannot rely on uh, um, uh, soak uh, pits or storage ponds uh, for infiltration. Um, while ago, we look at, uh, we mentioned about the rainfall data, basically for small subdivision, we look at the short duration intensity. Um, would be useful also to look at the maximum daily rainfall uh, particularly in designing uh, um, cisterns and uh, also notable storm and flood history. Uh, usually, in our study, we look at flood history by interviewing uh, residents in the area. Again, we go back to standards. What are the standards? And these are the data that we need. Look at the catchment. Uh, this is just a, a sample. Um, subdivision, uh, somewhere in Consolacion, uh, our latest project, um, situated in a very uh, challenging uh, location. So we look at the catchment area, slope, land use, vegetation, soil properties, groundwater. Nowadays, of course, um, we are happy that we can utilize uh, a lot of technology. Uh, so this Google map shows um, the land use. So it speaks a lot in terms of what is the characteristic in the particular area um, all around our subdivision development, except for this particular section. It turns out to be a waterlog area. So that is the reason why it's quite challenging. And this is uh, the uh, digital elevation map, <coughs> DDM. Uh, again, uh, because of this technology, it makes our work easier to look at the um, actual condition in terms of its topography and even extending beyond the location of uh, the catchment. So this one, we look at the total catchment that is contributing into uh, this subdivision, proposed subdivision, catchment A, which is, happens to be bigger and you have catchment B, C, and D. Okay, so that's catchment, uh, rainfall. Hmm. I have two photos that did not show properly. Um, never mind. Uh, so that particular um, Photo shows the um, daily rainfall, monthly rainfall in Mactan. And uh, of course, this one is the rainfall intensity duration frequency curve, <clears throat> which uh, was discussed by Rick Fornis, engineer Fornis, a while ago. And so, uh, uh, if I won't uh, deal so much of that, but I just give you an idea that. Uh, when you design green system, you refer to um, the RIDF, rainfall intensity, frequency duration, and determine the uh, intensity for specific duration, uh, which is uh, uh, related to the time of concentration of the area. 
um, it's not the rainfall intensity that is published by Pagasa referring to the low, medium, and high um, hazard uh, intensity uh, that is different. Uh, when we begin to look at the area, we look at the impact before and after development. And usually, you have certain uh, um, develop, development within the area already, coming from 30% develop with imperviousness of 30%. Uh, these are estimates uh, which can be uh, recalibrated, calibrated as you proceed with the uh, planning. And after development, usually, uh, imperviousness increased to um, 70 percent. Remember in the previous presentation that I have for subdivision, you, you are required to have 30 percent uh, open space, but somehow that includes the road, which is also an impervious. So the imperviousness even goes as high as 80, 90 percent, unless you provide, uh, you make some provision that every household should allocate rain garden in their area. We also look at the impact in terms of return period. Look at, um, let's say, just for the sake of comparison for our client, we look at the um, two year return period, 10 year return period, and what's the flood level implication of that and different structure in terms of addressing flooding. Drainage line, need flood wall. Uh, we're going to put up the tension basin. Uh, but for me, um, in our planning, we encourage uh, our client to put up one for ecological reason. So this one is the flood Indonesian map in that particular area um, for two years before development, about 0.45, as I mentioned, this is already a water lag area. So before development, 0.5 meter depth. After development, you have 0.85 uh, meters depth, so basically it doubles the, uh, the flood depth flood level in that particular section that is shown. Let me just uh, see if this will clearly show. So that's the uh, model. <clears throat> um, 10 years return period on the left side, you can see the uh, subdivision and all around it after developing, um, there's still flood waters. Um, I'm using a PC stream, which is a, um, has a capability of uh, two-dimensional modeling. Um, I, this can also be done using uh, HEC-HMS and HECRAS. I simply prefer uh, PC stream, which is me uh, easy to use. So that somehow gives the client uh, an idea of uh, what is happening in the area. This one also, uh, some illustration. Uh, this is the profile of the main drainage line, collects from outside and passes through the middle section of. Uh, uh, the property. So as you can see here, this particular section, we allowed water to pass through the subdivision itself. Otherwise, uh, if you're going to uphill the area, it is going to um, flood um, a lot bigger area upstream of this division development. So as uh, stated in the water code, uh, Located downstream, we need to receive water from upstream. So that's what we apply in this particular um, study. Um, very important uh, parameter also to show is um, this is a water depth. Uh, one particular section, we just adapt one particular section here. Uh, the water depth before and after development. You can see uh, 0.7 um, and then about 1.1 something. So that's the difference. That will also give us an idea on the backfill 
that is needed backfill height. So, um, just to summarize designing drainage system, uh, you need to prepare in uh, prepare a preliminary layout, um, drainage line in a subdivision, locate the outfall, um, look at the basin, the tension basin if you need to, design, uh, situate the inlets, and other structures uh, that is necessary in your planning, in your uh, drainage system. Then second, you need to calculate the flows. Um, you can use rational uh, formula to do that, um, but uh, if you know drainage system which are interconnected with each other, then you will have difficulty um, really in calculating. So it would be bet best to use uh, available uh, models. Um, you can have you can download the uh, EPA Swim, uh, that's US EPA Stormwater Management uh, model. Uh, which will give you um, um, simpler modeling uh, calculation uh, with uh, so many interconnected drainage lines. Once you have the layout, you can calculate the flow and you can uh, estimate again the capacity of the system. And uh, if the uh, system uh, does not, uh, there's no surcharge, meaning there's no overflow in the uh, section then uh, you can uh, adapt it maybe you can reduce if there are some overflow then uh, you can increase the size in order to meet the side volume and you you can recalibrate basically recalibrate recalculate the flow uh, once you um, change the uh, parameters so that simply gives us an idea on the iterative process in uh, Design calculation of drainage line. So this is a design. Um, okay, um, a while ago we have already identified um, the out outlet or inlet uh, location. Again, I have some problem with my lines. Have some photos that needs to be shown here. Anyway, um, I was just um, trying to show um, some representation of what that means on previous slides that we had. So now we just uh, proceed with sustainable drainage system. Um, what is it? We haven't talk much about that here in the Philippines, but uh, um, other countries are really into it. And so I think it is time for us to bring this concept um, here in order to have, uh, in order that our structures would be sustained in the long term. Uh, you will be, sort, you know, uh, comments coming from different sectors that uh, um, the the drainage system, a lot of the drainage system that are implemented are still um, experiencing surcharge, we're still experiencing flooding. And uh, if I'm going to answer that, you know, it is possible that during the time of installation, uh, we are only considering the present condition, but uh, the future condition is not considered. Now, if we do not, um, uh, clarify or we do not uh, restrict any future increase of flow then uh, our drainage today will not be sufficient next year and so therefore uh, we we have to have a policy in terms of uh, regulating the um, discharges or the flow uh, that will be consistent with um, our objective of having a sustainable drainage what is sustainable drainage? It's basically a structural, uh, non-structural system that alleviate, alleviate flooding, uh, flooding that is uh, caused by uh, alteration of the catchment characteristics. And uh, I like what it says here, uh, storing, reusing surface water at source, increasing flow rates, water courses. And uh, so 
if you look at these four items here, very important. Number one, source control. We need to control the flow at source. And it starts from your home. Uh, question is, do we have, all of us have a, a water cistern that will control? Maybe not. Uh, I doubt if uh, we have reached 50% uh, in our community here in Midru, Cebu utilizing uh, rainwater catchment at home. But this is very important, source, co source control. Uh, the sustainable drainage also is beneficial because it uh, provides pretreatment, the use of vegetated swales, um, even uh, detention basin, uh, filter trenches, removes pollutant. So this is very important. Uh, the tension system, uh, it delays discharge. And you know, when you delay discharge, then you reduce the um, peak flow. And um, using uh, sustainable drainage, you allow for infiltration of uh, water. So that, that's what it is. So what are these systems? Basically, I clarify, uh, classify this into four. Uh, detention, retention ba basin. Um, Basically, the, the difference between the two, detention, uh, you detain and then you release uh, at a later time when necessary. Retention, uh, um, basically water stays there and uh, allowed to seep through the ground. Um, there's two types also for, uh, deten uh, for detention. You have an inline detention system and you have an offline detention basin. And uh, this one is... Uh, Coming, this illustration is for the particular case from uh, the PUB um, in Singapore. This is a nice one. Um, so it has a uh, different implication in terms of uh, the reduction of the flow. The second one is uh, bioswales and infiltration beds. So um, that basically what it is, you know, water is allowed to flow through a, um, a um, soil um, Filter, um, you know, plant planting strips, perhaps uh, the middle of the road or the side of the road, and allow it to infiltrate That's your uh, bioswell or bioretention. Um, you can see a different uh, photo here also. Uh, so this is very important. But one of the uh, comment that I um, got uh, from my friend, come from uh, from Professor Yu from Taiwan, is that. Uh, of course, our road network are sloped, not towards the um, infiltration beds, not towards the planting strip, but uh, you know, uh, towards the gutter. So, so you you would expect that water is not uh, stored in this section, but uh, it is captured uh, automatically by the gutters and inlets. Uh, towards uh, and close towards the waterways. So something uh, must be done and uh, maybe can be redesigned. Not necessarily the slope, but uh, there should be a catch uh, drain in order to allow water to flow towards the area. Another thing is uh, the rain garden. Um, you can do this in your home. If you're living in a condominium, maybe you cannot uh, do this, but if you have some space within your property, um, you can, you cannot, uh, of course, quantify the, um, the overall impact that you are com contributing to the reduction of uh, flood flows and also improvement of water quality. So this is another uh, important aspect of uh, sustainable rain barrels. Of course, uh, a lot of us are familiar with that. Uh, these photos are installed in my home and uh, this one is about uh, one cubic meter this one here is another so another one cubic meter so two cubic meters this one 220 another 220 liter and uh, another underground somewhere around uh, four four cubic meters all in all um, storage. And uh, 
I look at my water bill. Uh, our neighborhood are complaining because they're paying something like uh, 1,000, 2,000 pesos uh, per month. And uh, mine is, uh, last, last month we paid something like 300 pesos. So um, it uh, reduces uh, the cost. And not only reduce the cost of uh, the water bill, um, but again, the ecological purpose, of allowing it to be captured and used in uh, some of these early charges used in our gardens. So what are the impacts? Impacts to uh, stormwater runoff, if we are going to use that. Uh, this one is a, uh, a model that we I prepared. <clears throat> You have rural and urban development. Uh, you'll notice that uh, when you develop an area, the uh, peak flow um, generally doubles. Here it's about 0.15 and then you have 0.30 um, after being developed. And it also deteriorates um, the river water quality if um, there is a development without capturing uh, stormwater flow around 30% increase in runoff if you do not have any um, LID or BMP structures. So also increase erosion, disturb uh, river ecosystem. So basically that's the impact um, of any development without any uh, uh, consideration of, uh, of um, sustainable drainage structures. How effective are they? Um, I look at uh, the runoff hydrograph um, for the different sizes of um, different sizes of uh, of detention basin. By the way, this detention basin is uh, uh, offline. You have 200, 250, 300 uh, cubic meters capacity detention basin. You'll notice that. Uh, for the 200, there is a small spike here, uh, but for the 250, um, basically the peak flow is more or less the same as the 300 cubic meter. So in terms of peak flow, um, and therefore the 250 cubic meter capacity for a one hectare, this is a one hectare land development. So for every hectare, uh, something like 200, 250 cubic meter capacity detention can already simulate or mimic the original runoff of a non undeveloped area. So right, so so if you if you're going to develop an area and you do not want to alter the um, the hydrologic process, the peak flow is still the same. Uh, it would be useful to have um, 200 cubic meter capacity detention in order to reduce that. Uh, this is for a 10 years return period. Of course, um, if you have a smaller uh, return period, five years, two years, um, the, um, the increase or the reduction of uh, big flow would be uh, lower also. Okay. Um, so this one, how effective are this? This is inline and offline. You'll notice that inline is not so effective in uh, reducing uh, peak flow, particularly for high, uh, higher uh, return period, 10 years and more. Uh, but the offline uh, significantly reduces. Um, how about the bioretention rain garden compared to a detention basin? Um, in terms of reducing peak flow, uh, you will do well if you have the, the detention retention basin, 200 cubic meter. The bioretention and rain garden, uh, this is equivalent to around uh, uh, 1,000 uh, square meters area for every one hectare. So the reduction is not much, um, maybe around 15% um, the most, but for a detention basin in a one hectare development, uh, somewhere around uh, 50-60% reduction. What's the benefit? Uh, one, if we are going to adapt that, um, the quantity, 
uh, will be reduced. Uh, stormwater, that means flooding would be reduced also. Uh, quality will also improve, quality of water. Um, erosion and sedimentation uh, will definitely reduce. Uh, of course, we have some maintenance and uh, operation maintenance of our system, but I believe it's still lower compared to uh, uh, maintaining our drainage line, uh, dirty drainage line uh, in downtown Cologne. You know, if uh, all of the uh, developers, including the existing ones, will have their own uh, uh, basin where uh, the initial flow uh, water which contains a lot of um, debris, perhaps, you know, so sediment uh, will get trapped. So there will be an aesthetic value also if we have to adapt that. Just uh, again, for our personal, for my personal experience, use of rainwater against um, pipe water. Um, pipe water meaning coming from the local water district. It reduces somewhere around 20 to 40% savings in our water cost. You know, the rain barrel is only about 1,500. You can buy even cheaper one, less than 1,000. Cost of pipe, or of pipe water is about 20 pesos. Of course, depending on how much you consume, 16 pesos to as high as 40 pesos if you are commercial development. But let's say 20 pesos per cubic meter. Total water harvested one year, it's about 26 cubic meters, you know, 20 pesos. Uh, in a year, you will have a savings of uh, 520. Uh, if you are a regular consumer, but the high consumer, um, you have 30 pesos, 40 pesos uh, water cost, then that would be higher. Uh, so about three years uh, return. Uh, plus, of course, the benefit to the water resource environment if you are using a uh, concrete tank maybe uh, 8,000 8, pesos for one cubic meter you can harvest about 2,100 uh, cubic meters in a year somewhere around 2,000 pesos a year savings plus so that's that's about four or five years return of your investment plus of course the benefit water resource and environment and less frequency of flooding so that's simply how I look at it, you know, and how I present that to my client. Uh, what do we need? Uh, we need a coherent local ordinance that will spell out the need for stormwater management. Uh, we also need clear guidelines on design and installation of st such structures. Laws shall be applied not only on proposed development, but also existing development and building. If we are going to focus only on uh, the proposed development that are now applying for building permits and uh, land development permits. And we're only looking at uh, perhaps 20, 30% of the problem. Uh, to me, we should not exempt the uh, existing um, developer uh, from getting away from this responsibility of contributing to our ecology. Monitoring maintenance of such BMP and LID structures needed need to do retrofitting. Perhaps this is good uh, to retrofit um, our existing drainage to incorporate uh, LIDs, that's low impact development structures. So just a summary again, uh, just to capture what I have uh, shared. <clears throat> Uh, we talk about the drainage issues, uh, basically technical, legal, and uh, social. Again, there's in the middle here, uh, I'm not sure why it disappears. This is the planning process. And basically, um, it's a circular um, motion where you do some data collection and calibration, and then you perform analysis, and then you develop the plans, drainage plan. And when that's satisfied in terms of legal requirement, ecological requirement, and of course your client, then uh, that would be good. Otherwise, um, you do some calibration, uh, generate scenario, and, uh, and do analysis again until it is acceptable. 
for sustainable drainage aspect. Uh, we need to minimize the impact of development. We have to look at stormwater as a resource, not as a waste. And uh, we need to incorporate various DMP structures. Okay, so that's all for my part. Um, you can contact me um, in this uh, email and also my phone number if you have some query. Thank you very much.